get started. So for today, I'm going to be presenting to you a little bit about optimistic prolapse and also how Cortezi uses it uh, for our technology and what it can offer to whoever builds on it. And um, first, uh, we're going to start with a quick overview of Cortezi, just very briefly. And then uh, I'm going to compare a little bit uh, in a bird's eye view the differences between Web2, 3, and how it looks when you build on Cortezi. And uh, then I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, rollups. Finally, I'm going to present to you a very simple, a small sample code of our Cortezi app uh, written in Python. So here is a uh, DAP written in Python that works right now inside a Cortezi machine. I don't expect you to understand it right now, but it's just to show that it's a simple, plain Python, and you can have libraries, and you can have interactions within the machine, you can have access to other APIs that you develop. So it's really a server um, used as a dev. So Cortezi uh, is a foundation that uh, has been working uh, on this since 2018. We've been a while building stuff. Uh, so it's not just uh, some new company coming up when Rollups showed up. Um, and uh, the team has been building this machine for a long while. And then the Rollups uh, te technique appeared and it just felt like a glove. So we adapted the machine to, to be a Rollups solution and scale Ethereum. So the main idea behind uh, Cortezi, but I guess to some extent, uh, all rollups is that Ethereum is awesome. Uh, there is a lot of interesting stuff about it, namely like uh, it is secure, it's uh, censorship resistant, uh, it strives to be decentralized, and that's really good, but that comes up with a lot of consequences and costs. Uh, it is low, it gets to be very expensive, and that means uh, we are always gen uh, building a process of gentrification of the network. So we are evicting dApps that are not prof profitable, even though they may be important for the communities. And for the newcomer developer, it's cumbersome because you need to understand about uh, machine architecture. You need to learn how the EVM works. And then uh, a new language like Solidity Viper, and even low level stuff if you actually need to go that far. So it limits you uh, in several ways, even though it brings another, uh, a lot of new interesting features. So the main idea is like, what, what if we could have complex computation inside a blockchain and maintain security guarantees? So the Cortezi solution is a transparent VM so instead of being another EVM-based network, a sidechain, or even a rollups, we have a RISC-5 uh, emulator. RISC-5 is an instruction set uh, for a general purpose processor, just like the ones on your hand for uh, your computer or your phone. So uh, you can think of it like a Docker machine of sorts or a uh, virtual box. And uh, we made it deterministic. So we got something. RISC-5 is open source, open hardware to be more specific. So uh, we got it from the community, and we made it deterministic, and we applied it to blockchain. So um, here's things that you get. So like any company and person can build on top of RISC-5. It's auditable. It's more secure because of that, because a lot of people has, have been working in this project. It's a platform processor, like I said, so you can run an operational system inside it, inside it. So that's why we were able to port Linux to the blockchain. Uh, we made it deterministic, so that means you can dispute any computation that happens on it. And of course, because it is a full machine, it's very uh, able to do massive computation. And you can expand on it uh, like you would do in any server or server application. Uh, the main difference between most uh, optimistic rollups and what we do at Cortezi is like we have a local consensus. So if you think about Ethereum, 
uh, the more computers you add to the network, you're adding on security, uh, decentralization, but you're not adding processing power, you're not adding throughput. However, uh, with local consensus or DAP specific rollups, what you have is uh, DAPs that don't fight for the resources. They don't fight amongst themselves. They have their own sets of validators. So what that means is uh, now, um, as the more DAPs you have out there, you're actually increasing the overall uh, capacity of Ethereum to process things. And that is all uh, really good and possible because of the dispute protocol. So whenever you have uh, a problem, whenever there is a disagreement between validators, it is not a majority um, consensus. It's really, uh, it really goes back to Ethereum and uses it as a judge. So the same emulator I just talked to you about, the one risk five that you can run on a machine for Cartesi node, it's also implemented in Solidity for the EVM. So whatever process you can do off-chain, you can do on-chain as well. But with this verification game dispute, you actually go down to the very instruction cycle that you disagree with the other node, and you only need to prove one instruction cycle on the Ethereum machine. And that is possible because the machine is all merkalized, so you know exactly what the instruction cycle needs to access, like the memory states, and you just need to uh, upload this section of the machine and all the Merkle proofs for it. That means that even if there is collusion uh, among uh, validator nodes of a specific DAP, uh, as long as you have one honest validator, you can uh, go back to Ethereum and have the correct settlement. So how does an optimistic rollups actually work? Any rollups in general, but this, in, this specifically. So you start with the Ethereum blockchain. And whatever you do, you're always making state transitionings uh, inside the, the main chain. The rollups, it, it changes a little bit. So you go there to a certain block, and you basically state the initial state of your computation outside. You say, hey, I'm starting a new machine here, and this is the state. And people who join your rollup, basically they are agreeing with you that the initial state is correct. Then you stay outside for a uh, amount of time that you specify. Mostly nowadays we've been using seven days because of the security guarantees of it. So for seven days you go on doing things off chain. Uh, when the time is up, you go back to the main chain and say, hey, after all that's happened, this is the new state of the machine. And people have the chance to verify whether or not you're telling the truth. If they disagree, they can go back and do the dispute and uh, fight you on exactly where you might have been wrong. However, if they agree after seven days, everything is settled, all this computation do not need to happen again inside Ethereum. So that's why uh, optimistic rollups, they expand the main chain they are uh, tied to in computational resources. So the overview. Um, here's just a baseline, so you always have some kind of a UI, mostly nowadays uh, browser. Um, then you have the software for the browser that you want the UI to, to work with. Then you're going to have a connection. It can be a socket connection. It can be uh, HTTPS, for instance, with a set of servers. They are centralized and they connect to a, se a set of databases that are centralized as well. That's how Web2 works mostly. We are very familiar with that. Web3, especially with Ethereum, you changed the landscape because now your business logic doesn't live anywhere physically. It's in the blockchain itself. Supposedly, everybody's running their own nodes, so they can just communicate with their node, local nodes. Uh, honestly, though, we know uh, we've been using Infura too much. We've been using Quick Node and whatnot. It is what it is. However, it's much more uh, secure because whenever there is any issues, anybody can just spin up their own full node or even a light node and make sure that the, the information they're receiving is correct. Uh, with Cartesi, it's very similar. Here, I just did a very clean version of it. I'm going to break it down. But 
these two are connecting to nodes, just like Ethereum nodes. So supposedly people should be running their own uh, validator node, a validator slash reader node of their DAP they are connecting to. And inside a Cartesian machine, I made a sure to have this image over here because uh, we are used to the EVM, but how would a Docker-like machine work, right? So there is no access to the internet. I need to stress this point a lot. So because it's a Linux server, it doesn't mean it needs to have internet connection. It communicates uh, through the blockchain. And that communication happens using Linux drives, and that's cumbersome and difficult to use. So instead of uh, teaching you how to use the operational system to that level, we've created this HTTP dispatcher. It's an API that's running inside a machine that wraps up all this uh, uh, complexity and just changes it into several uh, four endpoints that are really simple to use. So by just doing RAS communication with these four endpoints, you can receive information and output information back to the blockchain. So now it's the blown up version of it. So first, you still see the JSON RPC over there. And that's because we have the data availability problem. So blockchain is both data and computational power. Optimistic rollups, they're not solving the data problem. They're just solving the computational problem. So what it means is, if we are playing chess in a rollups, you still need, need to be able to prove that the moves happened. So if we don't have um, the base layer as a data availability source for the, for the information, it means people can cheat by just denying information. So let's say I'm playing someone, someone here, and they are about to lose. They can say, no, I never did this move. How am I supposed to prove that they actually did it? Now you post this information to Ethereum, and now you have a proof that they actually did the move in the chessboard. Um, so that's why we still have the JSON RPC communication. So it's still communicating with the Ethereum node, and people should be posting their transactions. Eventually, if you think about other solutions, uh, other projects that have the same solution, so like Arbitrum or uh, Optimism, you're going to see they use sequencers for that. But effectively, what they're doing is posting the things uh, to the Ethereum network. And then uh, at the very end, you see there is a graphical API. So this graphical API, is, it is useful for you uh, when you're handling the UI, what is being sent, what is being produced uh, from the node. So we have three main outputs from the Cortezi node. We have a report, which is basically just a log. You can still, act, if you're running the node, you can still access the full log of the process, but it's really good way of uh, having a clear and clean uh, access to the machine when you are uh, using other processes. So report, for instance, is very useful, um, sorry, is very useful uh, um, as an Ethereum call, for instance. So if you're checking a balance of your C20, you don't want to make a transaction. You just want the EVM to tell you what is the balance at the current state. So you can generate reports for that. We're going to see this. Um, I notice it's like an Ethereum event. However, with a spin, you can prove that the event happened. So if somebody creates um, a game, and there is like events about winners and losers of the game, and suddenly another project shows up and say, hey, you know what, I want to create a badge for whoever wins 10 games. Now the person have a pro has a problem because how they are supposed to use the Ethereum events to prove they won. You can't, you can't do that on chain. However, the notice that you produce here on the Cortez machine is a tied to the Cortez machine state. So you have a Merkle proof that the notice happened. So it's really useful in that way. The voucher is just like the notice in that sense. So it's provable, but it's also gonna become a transaction. So we call it voucher because you still need to wait for the seven day window. So it's not truly a transaction until the moment it is. So whenever the rollups is settled, you can, uh, as a user or as a developer, you can automatize that as well. You can pick up the voucher, for instance, a withdrawal request, and go to the system, to the rollup system, and say, hey, I have a valid voucher. I would like to execute it. So it becomes a true transaction on Ethereum. 
So you can use that to interact with other uh, smart contracts and apps. And finally, we have the HTTP REST there, and that's the, your direct communication with the node. So the Ethereum call I was talking about would be actually done through the inspect request. So you send a quick, um, a quick uh, request to the machine, it's gonna wake up, spin up, uh, do whatever you program it to do, and die, and roll back to the initial state. So it doesn't affect the internal state of the machine long term. So it's really useful for uh, populating UI data. It's really useful for, for you to be debugging the internal state of, the, of your program. Um, and whatever else you can think that this does not need to uh, transition the state. So going back to the code I showed you before, you're gonna notice at the very beginning that, um, I'm sorry, one second, that we are actually importing Python libraries. This is not a Python-like library. This is not a Python domain-specific something for blockchain. This is truly Python running. Uh, it was just compiled for RISC-V. On the yellow side, uh, we created uh, as a utility for people, a CLI, that it's based on hard hat, by the way, that helps you send quick uh, data to the machine so you don't have to be developing your own scripts just to test things out. So here, uh, we're basically creating a new transaction and sending hello there uh, payload. And then you can use the same CLI to uh, list any new notices, new reports, or vouchers that was created uh, since you last call it. Um, so here, I have an example of a Python echo dap. So it's supposed to send back whatever I send it to it. So going back there, you're gonna notice that I grab the information for the uh, HTTP dispatcher I was talking before, the, the REST API that makes things easier from the environment, so you don't need to hard code it anywhere. And um, here, I'm, um, how to say, I'm, I'm signing up two types of handlers. So there's too many, uh, too high level of handlers inside the Cartesian machine when it comes to these requests. One is the advanced stage, so that's the, those ones I was talking about. Whenever there is an input, you're actually gonna change the state of the machine. And the inspect state is those that come from the HTTP uh, inspect request, I just talked about, the ephemeral stuff. And here comes the most important request in this program. So whenever you start this program, you're actually starting things up, right? Like uh, uh, registering, uh, starting your process, heating up the machine in a way. So basically, uh, the very first time your machine wakes up, you need to tell the architecture that it is done, it's ready. It's like deploying a new contract. So you call this finish uh, re uh, endpoint over here. So what it does is tells the uh, wrapper that I told you, uh, it gets that information and tells the framework that it's ready to accept new requests. So from the perspective of your code, the machine went to sleep over here. So the line 24, your program dies for a second. Whenever there is a new request, wakes up exactly at the line 24 and resolves the post request. Returning to response, the new request. Now we just unwrap the JSON request. Uh, we check what type of requests we have which is the, of the type advanced or inspect. Since it is input that I've sent, it's gonna be a, a handle advanced type. So we're gonna go there to the function. You're gonna see them grabbing the data from the data, uh, the payload from the data I just received. And I'm just putting it back into a new notice. So I'm creating a notice right now. I'm not gonna do anything with this data because it's an echo. And now I just need to call the um, notice endpoint to create a new notice. With that, um, I've basically concluded most of the things that this needs to do. So line nine is just making sure that I finish with a accept state, because if you reject, you roll back the machine. So you're gonna see that in line 27, I'm sorry, go forward, yeah. Line 27, I'm just uh, refilling the finish status with accept, 
And because we are in a loop, I'm going to go back to the finish state. So I'm going to go back to the post on one second. I'm going to go back here and queue the machine again. I'm just telling the framework I'm done. I've done all the process that I needed. If I was uh, sending an HTTP request, you would come here to the handle inspect. And in this case, I can only produce reports. So like I said, notices and vouchers, they come with a uh, proof. And because this is going to be rolled back, there is no proof for those. So you can create as much as you like. It's just not going to do anything. The framework doesn't enforce you. It does not break your machine. Just don't do anything. So here I'm creating a report. And if I were to list the reports later, I would see on the other side. Finish accept. Now, supposedly, I would be listing the new notices, and you would see the, the payload over there. Um, that's it for the workshop. Uh, I'm open for questions now if you have some. So she asked me if I can change the state of a smart contract on chain while the operation system. So yes, but through the voucher. So let's say I need to transfer uh, tokens to somebody. Uh, we create a voucher that will be later executed. And the execution of a transaction is actually changing the state of a smart contract, right? So that's how I would talk back with uh, native Ethereum dApps. So uh, we saw there that we have inputs being sent to the machine. How that, that is possible? On the Ethereum network, we are actually deploying a set of contracts for the roll-up architecture. And the set of contracts are actually an alias for the off-chain code you see here. So this dApp, this Cortez dApp, actually has a Ethereum address. Whenever you interact with it, it's actually an input. And whatever vouchers get executed, it's executed with the message sender from that address. So uh, all the other dApps understand that it's coming from this address that it doesn't know what it is exactly, but it's basically the Cartesi dApp. So there is an alias there, a proxy and an alias at the same time. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. So it's not private key based. So it's a set of validators, right? So you have a set of validators. They're uh, enabled to interact with that and act um, as owners, so to speak. But it's also a voting, in a sense. That's why you have the seven-day window. So if anybody has anything um, they, they see is wrong, they can dispute that. And you can keep disputing for a while until you get to the correct state. And that means nobody is the owner exactly, but there are like responsible people for that. Does it make sense? It's like a voting system in a way. In a way. But you ensure that the execution is correct because you have the emulator on chain as well. So that's a good question. Because it is an app-specific rollup, as a developer, you define what is the requirement. So if it needs to run on a calculator, just don't use too much resources on your dApp. But if you need it to do like machine learning or something, it can be as beefy as you want your validator node. Yes, yes. But you need to be mindful as you are developing, like what kind of nodes do I want to have? Do I want to have all my users running it? So if I want my users running it, maybe I don't should be um, putting the node to be so beefy, right? Otherwise. Simple computers won't be running it. So it's like on the DAP developer to decide what they want. Because of, the, cause of the, the other slide I showed, like this one. 
every uh, DAP is its own little network in a way. So you decide. Yep. Yes. So if you say that's only going to be like two validators, sure. Maybe like a chess game, and that's fine. If you want uh, something that is a bit bigger, but 10 is fine, sure. Then if you want to have something that everybody is able to at least validate, then you need to be mindful of that. But there's no like intrinsic limitations, just like Docker in a way. Are we good here? So we are here for throughout the whole weekend. Uh, at the table, we are, you are so well, uh, welcome to, to visit us and ask us any question. So at the very end, I uh, have a link tree for Cartesi here. If you want to check documentations, medium, and why not. Thank you. <laughs>